Okay, it's time to go to questions from the audience, ladies and gentlemen. And just a reminder for those of you at home following uh, on Twitter uh, or following the live stream, uh, you can submit your questions via Twitter using the hashtag uh, ShapingSA or via the chat roll on the live stream. Uh, so get typing. We want your questions here and now. But to start off the Q&A session, uh, we have Kondragakis uh, from KPMG with a question about migration. Uh, just a moment, we just need to make sure we, we've got a camera on you. Off you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panel. It's been a, a really interesting session this morning. Mike, we've had a focus on the 32 to 52 year olds in the discussion. Um, our demographic isn't heading in that particular du direction, so an observation on that would be, would be good. It seems to me we've invested enormously in the state in our health infrastructure and our education institutions. How do we actually start to leverage those assets uh, to bring those people who are over 52 back into South Australia, to leverage our resources in the Barossa and the food and all the things that we've just spoken about, to actually create a well-being proposition um, those people don't necessarily need advanced manufacturing jobs, but what they will bring is wealth, what they will bring is a need for other kinds of services, and to actually start to broaden out our thinking a little bit about the demographic and actually using it to our advantage. Bernard. Well, uh, I, I do think that we're going to see uh, a social shift over the next decade. Uh, during the 2000s, uh, there was a social shift that everyone was abuzz with in Australia, the sea change shift up the coast, down the coast. You had it here in uh, South Australia with, uh, with Victor Harbour um, and, and, and so forth. Um, the social shift of the next 10 years, I think, will be around volunteering, generally. Just a whole lot of baby boomers hang around in their 60s looking for stuff to do, and especially here in South Australia, how can you leverage that? There is another social shift that I think we will see, and this is the concept of downshifting, downsizing. Mm. So you sell your house in Kalara, in the upper north shore of Sydney, that you uh, moved to from Adelaide in 1975, you bought for $40,000, that's now worth two and a half mil. Uh, you haven't got enough in superannuation, so you sell your house in Kalara. What's an equivalent house you could actually buy on the parkland, I would have thought, in Medindi, perhaps? Uh, for one and a half mil, and you've got another mil. So you, you can actually um, release equity, if you like, and live that urban lifestyle. You're not on the Gold Coast, you're not down on the South Coast. You've actually got access to an urban lifestyle, a sophisticated lifestyle. Um, South Australia now has a fantastic airport. I actually saw that as a strategic block uh, as someone who visits South Australia up until the airport was uh, improved. I think this idea of volunteering and of downshifting out of metropolitan areas, Melbourne, Sydney, perhaps Brisbane, uh, people coming home, if you like, uh, from their 50s onwards. And of course, wanting access to wellness, well-being, and, and knowing that there is first world, world-class, state-of-the-art uh, expertise in uh, medical technology and medical expertise, I think is a, is, is a plus. Now, that perhaps needs to be packaged, promoted, talked about, uh, and developed into a popular, aspirational way of living. And it releases equity. It funds your lifestyle. And it's an incredibly attractive proposition, I would have thought, to baby boomers that have simply not provisioned sufficiently for their retirement, uh, but who do have this um, uh, asset in, uh, say, Sydney's North Shore or eastern suburbs. Can I just play devil's advocate on that one for a moment? Wouldn't that strategy actually set us up for a bit of a fall 10, 15 years down the track when they've burnt, they, they've come over here. No, no, <laughs> they before they die, yeah. they've yeah. burnt yeah. through that excess oh, look, that's, that's for equity the next, that they can that's, release. That's for one of these forums in about 10 years. I can't solve okay. your problems for the that's, entire okay. century. All right. I'm going to solve your problems for the next 5, 10, 15 years or so. Okay. And then there might be another wave beyond that. I mean, there might be by the 2030s, and I actually think this is the case, uh, defence and military and space research technology. Yeah. Uh, it's beyond the horizon. It's well, well beyond the horizon. Who knows what technology is going to come out of South Australia, or Australia for that matter, in, by 2020? It might be biotechnology. Yeah. The idea of having a chip and you, you tell whether you're going to have a heart attack or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what that is. 
but I think we need to be dealing with the next five to ten years. Uh, beyond that, it's someone else's problem. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, that's only fair and reasonable. Um, uh, David, Joanna, would you like to uh, add to that at all? Uh, the the I 52 think, uh, plus. Yeah, I'll make a, a brief comment. I think uh, Vern's right. We need to packaging the attributes is very important from an attraction perspective, and then actually servicing them when they're here is is important as well. And uh, I think that does give us that roadmap towards the quandary of as as people become uh, more of an economic burden. Um, how do you actually make sure you've got the economy to support them? Um, and I think the silver dollar, um, and tapping into the silver dollar as a site, it has to be part of the economic strategy for us. So the migration, I think, is an, an attractive piece from, from a migration piece, and it op offers an actually an opportunity for us from, from an industry perspective. Assisted living intervention, and as you say, the chip that might go yes, no, maybe on the heart attack. Um, <laughs> the, but preventative health, uh, preventative medicine, uh, you know, um, well-being is are there. There are, there are components and pockets of that that we have. We have. A, a fantastic um, health innovation precinct to be to be leveraged into this cohort as an attractant and as something which can generate revenue in the future. Uh, I'm very interested in the in the cultural side of uh, things. I understand, you know, the, the government funding and so forth. But I'm particularly interested in how you actually shift thinking. How you make it fashionable. How do you make it cool? How do you make it hip to actually move from Kalara to Medindi? Uh, I, I think there was a shift in Brisbane in the 2000s. Up until the year 2000, there was, you know, if you're a young person in Brisbane, well, you know, the, the quicker you got out of there, the better. That was the view at that time. In the early 2000s, there was a pop group. I don't listen to pop music. I, they were called Savage Garden. And uh, apparently, they came out of Brisbane. And apparently, they remained in Brisbane. I thought it was extraordinary. The Bee Gees, as soon as they, they were out of there, <laughs> Um, you know, out of the colonial outpost, if you like, to the metropolitan sophisticated community. What do you actually need, I think, to shift culture, to shift thinking, to make it hip, if you like, is established personalities to actually show the, th show the pathway. This is legitimate. This is a cool thing to do, if you like. You need a couple of those people coming out of Sydney or New York or London or whatever it is, coming home to Adelaide. That, you know, I'm 55. I want uh, the next 25 years in my hometown. Uh, that, to me, shifts community thinking. So there's the government side, but there's also a cultural hip shift that needs to take place as well. There's a challenge for you, ladies and gentlemen. How do we get ACDC and, uh, and uh, what's his name from... Um, uh, name's on the tip of my tongue. Lead singer of Cold Chisel. Jimmy Barnes, we need to get them back to Adelaide. And we'll be hip and cool with the, cert with the demographic that you're actually um, after. And or I a think or if a given you definition of cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you do get those people back as well, you know, 50, 55, people have still, got, still want to contribute to the workforce. They've got fantastic skills. And um, uh, the, the whole notion of flexible work practices, yeah. technology, yeah. everything else, just makes that such an opportunity as well. Yeah. That's true. 55-year-olds are not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Close. Um, uh, let's, let's move it along because we have another question from the audience. Uh, Cathy Brown from TAFE, do you wish to talk uh, about training and skills? Yes, thank you. Uh, um, we hang on camera. Yep. We've okay. heard a lot today about universities and um, I'd just like to hear the panel's view on how they think vocational education can contribute to this creative, flexible and clever workforce that we've been talking about. Yeah, there, there, there has been a, um, a, a focus on uh, university education, but vocational training uh, um, for a more skilled workforce. Yes, very pleased um, that you asked that question because it's a really important question and uh, I'll sort of look back and quickly look forward as well. If I look back to eight or nine years ago, if we had a foreseen um, in the industry that I'm now in, oil and gas, uh, the major projects that would be going on at, uh, simultaneously and the requirements for the trade-based um, um, workforce, um, we would have been able to deliver projects a lot cheaper. Instead, we're bringing, and I'm, when I'm saying we, I'm talking about the industry, bringing people in from overseas, uh, welders is, is a big one, for instance. Uh, once all the projects are built, they're all going to go back home again, and we haven't really um, uh, leveraged that opportunity. So opportunity to look forward more than we did, I think. 
Um, but then there's the, the future-oriented stuff, and you know, we've just partnered with uh, TAFE uh, to build a state-of-the-art um, uh, onshore um, oil and gas sim simulation uh, experience at Ponsley, and that is, that's the sort of thinking we should have been doing uh, probably uh, six or seven years ago, but I'm glad that we, we are doing now. I think it'd be very important. Um, I I think a lot of damage was done to that sector 25 years ago uh, when the Prime Minister at the time um, said, uh, we're going to become the clever country, 1988. Uh, and um, all baby boomer parents at that time, then in their 30s with their young Gen Y kids at primary school, thought that's the way forward. Uh, my son, the lawyer, my daughter, the doctor, they're going to go to university. I don't want to give them dirty hands. That's not valued in modern Australia. Uh, which was fine during the 1990s. Then soon after the year 2000, we woke up and realised that even clever countries need plumbers and electricians and carpenters. And that's the shift that's taking place. If you look at Australia of the future, it's food, energy, resources, commodities, which require the technical skills. And I think we need to shift. Again, it's culture. It's as much our attitude to value the technical, manual skills of the future. The best thing you can do for your kids is to give them either a university degree or some form of technical training. The worst thing you can do for your kids is to leave them unskilled going into the future because uns the, 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 the sectors requiring unskilled work are simply contracting in this nation. So universities and technical training. And we need to shift parental thinking that actually you can be quite cool, quite clever, quite sophisticated, quite prosperous in your life path if you are a plumber or electrician or carpenter or builder or chef or whatever it is that comes out of the, uh, the vocational sector. Okay, we have another question from the audience. Uh, Michael, would you mind standing up so that we could, it's easy for the Michael Barber. Cameras. Uh, uh, we, hang on, we've got the camera on you? Comment just, 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 Michael. just a moment, Michael, we just want to need to make sure we've got a camera on you. Right. And any minute now, off you Great. go. Thank you. I have a question, but I just want to add my comment to the comment question from our TAFE colleagues. And I would like to urge people not to talk about plumbers, electricians, etc., because those people are highly proficient technical people. Part of our reason for collaborating with TAFE down at Tonsley is the intersection between the two of them. Plumbers today are electronic engineers and the rest of it, and there's a real mindset in the country. And the second thing is, coming back to your career moves, those people who start as plumbers or builders, if they want to build their own businesses, we need to move them up through the system in those eight to 12 jobs. So again, all of us tend to, I think, have a, a vision there. My question, though, is different. My question is a little bit off your South West Australian story, Bernard. There is a very, very developing part of Australia in the same time zone with a lot of needs, and where, do you, where does the panel see the Northern Territory and its needs feeding into South Australia as an economic driver for jobs here in South Australia. And again, it's, I think, part of an interesting aspect that we hardly ever think about here in South Australia. Well, I see, I have a very um, odd view of the Australian continent. Um, and I know I'm going to be quoted on this <laughs> with some trepidation. I see Tasmania as a colony of Victoria. Um, I see the Northern Territory as a colony of South Australia. And in fact, it was. It was one state administered by this state in the, in the 1920s or so. And strong cultural business links <coughs> still there 80 or 90 years later. Uh, the Northern Territory, of course, opportunities there in energy resources, commodities, uh, mining, perhaps. Not so much um, uh, tourism, uh, but I think there are skill sets that will be required uh, in the Northern Territory that South Australia, that Adelaide, universities and TAFE um, uh, vocational sectors can specialise in, uh, providing the skill sets for the state and, in fact, for colonies, for territories that are economically dependent or primarily linked through this state. So, yes, I mean, South Australia is what, uh, one and a half million people, whatever it is, uh, you bolt on the Northern Territory, you think as an economic unit, as a cultural functioning unit, it's about two million people and it's the broad slice of the middle of the Australian continent. It's a fair whack. All those resources leveraged against effectively one major city. 
why wouldn't you want to be in this place for the next 20 years? Okay, we're, we're, we have another question from the floor and then we're going to have to start to wrap up, I'm afraid. So, uh, we've got the camera on you, off you go. Andrew um, I just, uh, I, I completely agree with the panel, we can't predict the jobs of the future. Uh, I suppose the way I think of it, our kids are going to be traversing a lattice rather than climbing a ladder. Um, and I think Adelaide uh, is a really good world place to be most livable, most learning and most collaborative and connected. Um, my particular interest is um, professional services organisations with global clients and I've worked with a number of them um, and you know, of course um, you know, that that's creates a, um, a business that can pay, uh, you know, pay well. Uh, one of my friends is running uh, one of those companies now and he's, he's recently had to bring a, an executive over from the south of the US. In the US this fellow was on $105,000 to to put him in the equivalence of after-tax lifestyle position, he's got to pay him about $190,000. Now, um, I'd just be interested in the panel's comments. This seems to me to be a real issue. Um, you know, do they share that view that that's an issue? Uh, and if so, what can, we, what can we do about it? Joanne, I... I'm uh, sitting here nodding my head. <laughs> yes, it's a very big issue. Um, it increases the costs associated um, with uh, recruiting um, those people. Uh, so you have to be really sure that you're going to be able to get value out of that. Um, w if we're bringing someone in from the US, we have to gross up their package because of um, cost of living here versus um, the US. That then translates to cost of delivery of projects mm -hmm. and, um, and we all read the paper and know that this is um, a very expensive place um, to be... Um, uh, developing some of those resources projects. So it's a big issue. Um, we, we would try and counter that with some of the other benefits that we've also spoken about. Um, and um, we would also take the view that there's always going to be, be a bit of give and take in this. We don't want somebody that just come for the money. So, it, it, but, it, but it's difficult. And um, what we need to do about it, I guess, uh, I don't know if I'll be quoted on this, but it's, it's obviously a taxation issue um, and, um, and it's not going to go away. Uh, taking away things like living away from home allowances, which used to actually help us, um, cost us millions of dollars. So part of it is pitching that wine and those mm -hmm. roughing koalas. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's yes. let's uh, move towards uh, wrapping up this session because we are against the clock. Um, and as was made mention at the beginning of the session, uh, we realised that unless we talk outcomes from our discussions, then there's not really a lot of point of having these discussions. So I'd just like to quickly go through the panel and get two or three key outcomes that you would like to see perpetrated from this discussion. So, Bernard? Um, focus on uh, migration from overseas. Forget the Eastern Seaboard unless it's 52-year-old uh, Adelaideans uh, who have houses in Talara that might want a downshift. Um, uh, celebrate your locals. Uh, I want to see local media get on board and not going on endlessly about Adelaide expats doing well in Los Angeles. Start celebrating people who make it or, or build a business locally and shift the culture so that Gen Y do not have to think I need to go to Los Angeles to actually impress everyone back home. Um, and also uh, celebrate a culture of entrepreneurialism mm -hmm. uh, rather than tall poppy cut downism, which I think is an Australian trait. Uh, uh, celebrate people who actually build businesses uh, and especially Generation Y. They're the, they're the cultural shifts that I think we need to, share, to, to apply. The other point about um, uh, celebrating um, uh, technical skills also. Um, as well as uh, professional skills. I see it as a cultural shift as much as a technical shift or a requirement for funding in particular areas. There's other people that can fine-tune that. It's the cultural shift that I think is, is uh, much required in this state as it is in other parts of Australia. David, your dot points. Um, skills are skills. We have to recognise that they come from all quarters. Uh, and that goes back to the point that it doesn't matter whether it's a technical skill or an, an intellectual application piece. We need to have our skills, skills gap uh, analysis 
performed as a site, uh, and we need to know where those gaps are. And I think we need to actually work to better, to better market the attributes that we have that enable people to be successful while they're here. Um, I think that's site branding is fine, uh, destination marketing is fine, attributes of why this is a good place to live and work, that's what we need to focus on. And Joanne? Uh, I guess on the theme of uh, Bernard's as well, celebrate entre entrepreneurialism, um, promote it, uh, help people to see what's possible, make sure that people know that this is a great place to build a business from. There are, some, there are so many successful stories and, um, and then make it easier for people to actually build that business. I would like to just wind up the discussion with an observation. Uh, that is, uh, e even a lot of South Australians don't know, that the state library in this state predates the state by two years. We actually started the book collection in London two years before they jumped on the ships and came out. We have a claim on being the smart state. This is the thinking capital of Australia. And in that seedbed, we have the opportunity to build the skilled workforce that will take us into the future and capitalise on the opportunities that are there for us to take. Would you please thank my very talented and knowledgeable panel for this morning's discussion. <laughs>